here as well as my thought and uh, uh, my connections in learning more about sustainability and how to measure sustainability post-program. I will be sharing some of uh, the learning today with you. Hi everyone, this is Isabella Jean. Um, I am based in Boston. I'm an independent consultant and have spent the last um, 12 to 15 years uh, focusing in various ways on aid effectiveness questions as a researcher, facilitator, and um, an advisor to a number of international and local organizations. And my focus um, has been primarily on community engagement, accountability, and questions of um, transferring and shifting power to local organizations. I'm happy to share some of the lessons from a number of learning engagements I've been part of today. Wonderful, wonderful. Let's, uh, let's get started. Okay. So I will be semi-technician today. Uh, but we also have Ho uh, Howard and um, Richard who will be uh, with us from the conference and thank you for all your support today. Great. So we had uh, 80 people register, which is terrific. And you will hear a bell uh, every uh, six times today. You will hear a bell. Each of us are speaking for about 15 minutes. And then we have an open discussion with you guys for about 20. And then again, I'll invite the bell and then the, the next person will speak, okay? And we'll be doing a couple of short polls. Um, so today we're talking about sustainability ready, what it takes to support and measure lasting change. So can we have the first poll? So the first poll is, have you worked in a country with, that has received foreign aid? So how many of you, we're just trying to figure this out because uh, people that work in development, we can do development speak. So we want to make it accessible to everyone. Um, uh, some people may just be interested without having worked in a, in a what we call a developing country, quote unquote. So, so far we have evenly split, yes and no, 10 and 11, um, maybe a few people, 87% of people have voted. So that's good enough. So we're about half and half. Um, uh, we can, I'm going to uh, end the poll. So thank you. Um, so let's, um, let me just share the results. And uh, that's it for the poll. And so let me walk you through, Holtec, uh, next slide, please. And as folks are in the waiting room, where uh, you folks, we will be admitting people. Great. Okay. Can you see the next slide? Or? Yes, please. Okay. Somehow it's not letting me share. It's interesting. <laughs> We just tested. Every time that you test something and you uh, think it's working okay, uh, somehow. Let's redo this. Okay, we'll try it a different way. Or if nothing else, we can ask our IT experts to help us. So I'm just going to, while you guys sort this out, um, I have, like my colleagues, for 30 years, I've been working on global development and global development. And about seven years ago, I had this epiphany because it's a long story. But I was, um, I suddenly said, well, what happens after we go? So I started doing research on what happens after we leave. And so let me um, tell you that while all global development organizations do amazing, amazing monitoring and evaluation, the vast majority of us really track how well the money has been spent, what we have developed, um, how many people trained, how much, um, uh, how much the agricultural yields have gone up or the malnutrition has gone down. Um, after we go, um, not so much the focus of most global development projects is success at the end of the project. So uh, the expenditures are such, um, 
$5.5 trillion have been spent on foreign aid. $137 billion uh, was spent in 2014. And while, um, while most projects do, as I said, great evaluation, less than 1% of the time do we actually go back after the projects close and see what have been the sustained impacts. Impact is a complicated word. Um, many, it has many meanings for many people, but we really talk about sustainability in terms of the longevity, the durability of the results. Next. Holta. Somehow it's not letting me do next, so um, I'm sorry. This was supposed to be easy. <laughs> Or Howard, could you put it up on your screen and have it go? Let's try it one more time. I will try. Oh, okay, you're trying. So she's gonna try it one more time. Hello from France. Um, yeah, wonderful. So what we what we um, uh, what we talk about in terms of defining sustainability, there's, as I said, this is a bug that is also a leaf. So many evaluations look similar, but are actually very different. Uh, final terminal evaluations, look at the completed project or program. We, but we don't look at project, we, on, we don't look at actual sustainability because we have just finished. We only look at projected sustainability. Will the benefits last? we don't see if they actually have. So the Japanese, the JICA, um, uh, Japanese International Cooperation Agency, JICA is phenomenal. Um, they conduct typically three years after completion and they look at both the effectiveness and the sustainability of the project. They have a remarkable amount of data and on valuingvoices.com, we feature some of their, um, some of their lessons in the, uh, um, in our blog and on uh, our Catalyze, Catalyst tab. Next. Terrific, it's working. So we make lots of unproven assumptions. So we, what we do is the left one, we assume that over time, um, if empowerment has taken time to build, then it's gonna take off like a rocket. We typically do not assume that um, over time, things will falter or fail. We do not assume that we, and once we've sprayed it for pest control, we never assume that there will be pesticide immune mosquitoes. We just assume we've sprayed and we're good to go forever. Uh, this is something Sanjeev uh, showed me. Um, so value voices selections, what do we call sustainability evaluations? We don't consider uh, those that are desk studies, uh, sustainability, post-project sustainability. We don't care if, you know, some other organization or agency has gone to measure malnutrition. We actually try to look at what the project has accomplished two to 20 years afterwards. Mixed methods, that means we use qualitative, which is interviews and quantitative, which is surveys. And we look at a mix of the two results. We believe very strongly that the only people that can tell us what has been sustained are community-based partners and the participants. We also look into why they were sustained or not. And we think there are incredibly important lessons how to fund design, implement, monitor, and evaluate differently. And then we also do something which for in the field of post-project evaluation is radical. Um, we acknowledge local efforts. We believe uh, local communities, as all of us on the call probably do, um, are powerful and are capable. And we look and see what they have accomplished since donors went away. Typically donors only care about what sustained of their, what they put in. But, uh, but we care about what the communities generated. Next. I think I have discovered the culprit. Every time that someone has to be admitted, uh, the screen freezes. Oh, dear. I can, I can jump in. Wonderful, Howard. That okay. would be terrific. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kind of you. Can you st um, st I stop sharing? Yes. Thank you. Terrific. Good. As long. Thank you for your patience. Which slide are you on? 
Okay. Uh, I was yeah. on this, this orange circle. And so typically what we have is um, the program cycle uh, aid projects are typically designed, uh, funders, you know, determine what they want to fund, projects are designed, partnerships are developed, who is going to help us do it in country X. Um, who are the participants going to be of the project? And then we start, start it up and we do a baseline evaluation. We implement, so we monitor, we're going uh, clockwise. Now we're at implementation. Um, we then uh, implement two, three, five years. Uh, we then close the project. We exit, we do a final evaluation, but that missing green slice about learning from a post-project evaluation about sustainability is typically missing. So we need to add that. Next. Can you see the next slide? I cannot. All I can see is um, the orange slice one and we need the one beneath it with the grapes hanging down. Wonderful. So one of my clients, one of our clients, a colleague of mine, uh, uh, Rutera Kagendo and I in Tanzania, did a post-project evaluation in, two years ago of a project that had been closed out three years. And one of the things that was phenomenal about this is how the organization learned from it. Um, a great shout out to Lutheran World Relief because um, there were a wide variety of results, some positive, some negative. Um, in this case, an aspect of the positive is income from this grape production project. Um, Two thirds of people uh, had increased uh, their income. Uh, 6% stayed the same and one third the income had reduced for a wide variety of reasons. The reason I want to show you this is, um, and we will have this up on a, um, a shared folder for you guys to look at and you can also look at valuingvoices.com. What I absolutely adore about this is in the bottom right hand corner, you actually see the Lutheran World Relief response. So as a result of this variability in income, the trajectory did not go straight up. Um, Lutheran World Relief should examine developing the inclusion of youth in this agricultural activity. That was one of the failures of the project. Um, so as long as we're, provides us an astonishing amount of learning uh, for, the, for the project. Once you go back and do a post project, you could, the organization can learn a lot about how they design, implement, monitor, and evaluate. Next. Great. So three examples. This little, a little seedling coming out of the tree is what is emerging from local efforts. So we found, I did one for Catholic Relief Services in Niger. Um, we found that they felt so, communities felt so strongly about uh, keeping the local health clinic working uh, for safe deliveries that they actually had people that had weddings and baptisms in their community tithe, uh, donate to um, the cleaning and the upkeep of the health clinic or ownership. That's an example of resources and partnerships. The ownership and the replication, half of the members of the village uh, banks of PAC Nepal actually not only replicated the banks, but they also um, were helping each other on uh, address domestic violence. It's really been, um, it's really remarkable. Um, well after uh, PAC left, village banks were still replicating. Um, unintended impacts, you know, Lutheran World Relief in Niger many years earlier, and I had gone to do assets and consumption for women. Um, and there was a project focused on sheep breeding and instead they had improved and they had improved some water access. And the biggest impact of the project was the fact that domestic violence decreased when women had access to water um, because they could be beautiful and they didn't need to go spend eight hours every three days fetching water. They could be home, they could generate income. Lots of good things. Next. It, 
does not like presenter view. <laughs> okay, well, let's just keep going the way we are. Um, so we're going to, and what I'm arguing for is that we need to not only do the orange slice that I presented earlier with participation of our participants in the uh, in the um, in the center of all of our work, but we also um, and actually Howard, if I can just ask you a favor, and that is, I find the mouse going around disorienting. So sorry. Okay. It's okay. I just if you can just go back to where we were, that would just be terrific. Okay. Great. So um, and so, what we need to do instead of just the donors doing the design, we need to design for sustainability and exit with our partners from the beginning, and that includes funding. Who is going to sustain the funding? Who's going to sustain the partnerships? We need to um, along the green outer rim. We need to have indicators, knowing that we're checking our assumptions. How are things going? Because almost all post projects are mixed. Um, we need to monitor, oh sorry, that's a typo, monitor and adapt the programming based on what we're learning during the adaptation, in, improve some activities, take others away based on what the situation in the project is. And we need to do stakeholder, stakeholder um, consultations about who is going to sustain it and with what resources. Um, and so uh, next. So as Omu Batal from Mauritania said, I just adore this SDG uh, comment um, in 2017 on a meeting I was in. He said, it's not about your projects, it is about my country. So, um, so yeah, so now we have time for, uh, yeah, next, uh, questions and answers. So let us know in the chat box, or if anybody would like to unmute, we have um, about 15 minutes because it took us a little bit longer to, uh, to get my presentation started. So let's do, um, uh, let's, uh, yeah, let's um, uh, share the chat, talk, unmute yourselves, and we've got about 15 minutes, and then we'll move on to Holta, and then after her, Isabella. Indra, I'll right. start as I've been monitoring the uh, the chat and there is a question from uh, Michelle. Everyone, as you know, acts, uh, is very surprised when they see that only 1% um, of uh, um, programs actually have an ex post afterwards. And um, Michelle from France was asking, where does the stat come from? Uh, so I would love if you talk a little bit more about Value Invoices repository of Expos and how it is a hub for most of, including a lot of the donors to go and figure out uh, what Expos are publicly available. So, Sure. So there are, if you look at the USAID site, I think there's something like seven or 8,000 documents that say ex post. And when I first started this research seven years ago, um, I went and I looked at hundreds of them. And the vast majority of them show up in the show up in the um, uh, in the search because an a eva final evaluation says you should do an ex post, right? When you look at ex posts, I've just had a, a researcher do some um, some digging for us among the Scandinavians. So the French, we've and also other European countries, publicly available. UK's DFID has none. France has none. Sweden has one, Finland has seven, uh, the Dutch have 12, but that's because one report has 10 in them. Um, Norway has two, I believe. So it is, there was a huge wave of people that were doing impact evaluations and that's not long-term impact. Those should frankly be called effectiveness reviews because they're looking at, if we do, one intervention or do another intervention, which is more effective, not which is more lasting. Uh, I've spent seven years on and off funded by foundations like Michael Scriven's foundation, uh, looking at how many there are. We looked at uh, 900 and we roughly found about 60. Although JICA although, although and the JICA OECD have, um, have um, Hold on, I don't know why I'm suddenly, I'm suddenly uh, uh, echoing. echoing. Um, um, 
I don't know. So there, are, it is mind boggling how few donors look at post-project evaluation. I'm happy to talk to anyone about this if, other than the Japanese and some from OECD, a few from Germany. And the US has started doing more, which is delightful, but they have probably 20. I've worked on four of them. So, uh, so does that answer your question? Any more? I don't know if anyone can hear me or see me. Yeah, sure. Uh, this is Michael Joseph from Work Vision. Um, Hello. For, for the presentation. Um, okay. I have a couple points to make. Um, so there are many tools that can help with um, uh, defining sustainability, like cost-benefit analysis or cost-effectiveness analysis for different interventions. But the funding for those are uh scarce uh mm. how do we work around this uh, that's my first point and the second point i i see it in the chat and i like to echo this most of the proposals or most of the uh, uh funds are are predetermined for a specific project to so back back to the point of uh the great book time to listen how do we um, how do we work around this to to determine the local need, not not the not the fund need in a way that we need to uh, decolonize the spending? Thank you. Marvelous question. So Holta, who is from World Vision, can absolutely talk about the cost benefit. Isabella can talk about the time to listen. Um, I do valuing voices precisely to encourage donors to do more funding to, you know, a huge number of funders, Rockefeller, MacArthur, a lot of them, Gates, have funded impact evaluations, right? Because people do care about the program quality. But I personally, I'll give a, two short stories. One is, um, I was one of the early adopters of post-project evaluation, one of the first ones I ever saw, but 10 years ago, uh, they large international NGO. And they said, uh, I said, when are you going to do another one? You did the first one I ever found. Oh my God, I'm so excited. Did great learning from it. And when are you going to do another? And this woman whispered to me after a conference when I'd done a presentation, she said, you know, Yindra, we're, we're, we're still looking for a project that's successful enough to evaluate. Right? So the terrible fear in our industry is to admit that the projects are not roaringly successful, that the projects have mixed results, and that we are afraid that we won't get funding anymore. And that is part of the pathology of donors want us to talk about success so they can look successful, so they can get more money. So it's a culture more of spending than learning necessarily. But there are outliers. There are the organizations that we feature on Valuing Voices have actually gone and done one. Asian Development Bank did one and they admitted that 40% of their projects are not successful by closure. They already know they're failing. Right? So we think it needs to be a rather strong rethink of what our industry does. Hopefully uh, cost effectiveness will become more important and donors will, will see that if you say we haven't succeeded, like most corporations, they say we didn't succeed at every single product we launched. How do we learn from it, right? And how do we make it better? Um, and the second story, Isabella wanted me to say, so I'll say it now. I was in Zimbabwe doing a post project for an unnamed NGO because the results were, were not good. Only 10% of their programming was successful, um, was successfully sustained. Um, and this was very controversial in the organization, so we couldn't share it. But I was in Zimbabwe and um, 
uh, so it remained an internal learning, which they didn't even want to share with their headquarters. But anyway, so there was a uh, district uh, commissioner. Uh, he was about 80. And he stood up after, because we always present back to communities what we found and we ground truth our findings right, what do we need to add before we go present it to the donors. He said, I have been a district commissioner for 60, or di a district officer for 60 years. I'm now a district commissioner. No one has ever returned to tell us the results of their evaluation, much less come back um, and see what was sustained through our efforts uh, and what should be improved. Um, and it was, it was, uh, uh, heartbreaking for me that that's true. So here we are, we are where we are, so let's do things better in the future. Um, and so we have about five minutes left for me. So what other questions do you guys have? I, I see something about evaluation approach, participatory, everything is participatory. Because again, as we, we cannot possibly evaluate things from offices in Washington, London, Tokyo. Right? I mean, we have to go into the field. We have to ask people. We try and triangulate, talk to as many elderly, young um, medical doctors, mothers of malnourished children. We talk across all sectors. We do transect walks. We walk through the fields and look at the sustainability of the crop cropping. The one thing we haven't done that USAID called me out on after one of the exposes was looking at the actually the water quality, not the supply. So I always encourage people to take as many sector experts with them. Uh, if, if it's not us doing it, um, draw on the sector experts. And um, and uh, I see, you know, somebody said touchstone in our project, we could be put in special measures if we don't reach the targets. Absolutely. So it needs to be a culture of learning, not a culture of success, right? So it's talking to the donors and saying, we haven't reached this. Why don't we extend a year? There are some phenomenal uh, child year was exiting actually out of a country, um, uh, several countries in Africa and Asia. It's long story, but I'll, I'll share it in something else I'm working on. You'll see it on the Value and Voices site in a couple months. And what they did is they actually went to the donors and said, we are not ready to exit the country. Isabella will talk more about that. We need a year extension so we can help them get the resources, the partnerships, the, um, the capacity development so they can actually take over. And the more you build that in, the more sustained things are. Um, can we look at a uh, sustained change to a project? You know, attribution, it's never attribution, it's always contribution. That's an absolutely excellent question from Sonal. Um, we have to only talk, we try to isolate, so we try and choose project sites that are, um, th that to the degree possible other NGOs have not been there, at least concurrently. They could come later, but not at the same time, so we can isolate. I did one in Uganda that was 15 years later. It was a national program, and we found some remarkable sustainability because it was the Ugandans who designed the project. It was USAID funded, but the Ugandans designed it, so there was all of this buy-in and ownership to make their projects really, um, really sustained. Um, and we can talk more uh, later, but um, uh, developmental evaluation, what is the place of developmental evaluation in determining the sustainability? Holt is going to talk about methods, so I'll leave that one for her. And, um, and I don't know if there are other questions. Would anyone else like to say any question out loud? I think I've probably covered those in the chat. Indra, I'll just uh, reiterate um, that when we talked about, um, I like what Value Invoices has been proposing to insert a new cycle, a new element in the project cycle, because yes. without routinizing it as part of the project cycle, that we actually measure sustainability, and we um, we we are forced to look at it as part of the entire cycle, not close the cycle with the project ending, 
and we wash our hands, then it, we won't be held accountable. We won't be held accountable to mm -hmm. the results or the uh, making sure um, that we speak about um, contribution, attribution, or that we actually learn something for the next cycle. Yeah. Right now, that element of the um, do you evaluate post-program, it's left out. It's left at the discretion of the funder, at the discretion of the enthusiasts and the passionates like Yindra uh, or Isabella or many of you that are here. As if it's left at, um, at the um, mercy of what people think or what donors can or want, then we would be having this conversation probably even 10 years after now, a decade after, we'll still be talking about it. So oh, that, it's, yeah. that point of like making it part of the uh, project cycle, it's my main takeaway from your, <laughs> your session and how can I help uh, routinize that? Thank you so, so much. Yes, you know, I want to say Jaika, not, I was I was given an early Christmas present. There's a blog about it. You can read about it on Valuing Voices. It's like holiday hallelujahs. They actually not only do a post project three years after, but seven years after they go back to check if the recommendations from the post project were implemented by the implementers and the funders. Blown away. Blown. That's like my happy place that we're actually making sure things are sustained and learning from them and then saying, oh, is it a uh, whole table talk about this later. So the USAID has two bureaus, the Water Bureau and Food Security, put it into their strategy for their bureau, their kind of their department at USAID for this to be a really important part. And actually among all the Scandinavians, because just the researchers working on it now, um, Finland is the only one who actually defines it right. I mean, half the problem is, do we know what ex post is? It's not like, oh, six months after the project closed, we went back and we did an evaluation that was a little bit late. You look at different things. Um, so I definitely think that we need to put it into the program cycle in that way we get money to go do it, right? I don't need to do it. I think there should be hundreds of valuing voices and Holtas and Isabellas. Um, and so I think my time is up. I'm going to um, ding. I'm going to go back to our breath. And go on to Holta's terrific presentation. Thank you, everyone. Howard, shall we try one more time where I share the screens? Uh, I, I believe I've solved the problem. I've okay. downloaded it, so. Okay, um, awesome. <laughs> well, um, my part of uh, what I'll be sharing uh, today is uh, taking it uh, down um, a notch where with um, what Yin represented, we looked more at uh, what happens, do uh, projects actually go back? Uh, do we go back to uh, evaluate the sustainability of projects? Whereas I wanted to look at some of these um, stories that come from the field when we actually do post-program evaluations and what they um, they tell us and how some of the learning of uh, what we know about sustainability comes from the most unexpected uh, places. So next slide. Okay. For, um, this is just a snapshot of where um, my, the organization that I work for has conducted uh, uh, post-program evaluations. We have done in um, a dozen, just as World Vision US, where I sit, we have a dozen of ex post uh, um, evaluations in seven countries. Most of these um, studies were cross-sectional studies and they all use mixed methods approach. Um, and the reason for cross-sectional studies and the use of the mixed methods approach comes because of some of the limitations that are with the data when you try to go back, but also some of the questions that you are trying to um, respond to. Only two of this, um, out of this do uh, dozen of evaluations were externally funded. One was from um, USAID as part of a bigger, bigger um, exposed um, effort uh, from FANTA, uh, Food for Peace projects, and then one was funded by Gates, um, Bill and uh, Melinda Gates Foundation, which was specifically uh, commissioned uh, as an ex post evaluation. So all the rest were internally uh, funded. 
So there, um, there is hope uh, when I look at my own organization that there is interest in knowing what happens after our funding ends, after we exit um, a community, to the point that we are willing to invest uh, uh, funds that are not necessarily just commissioned by um, uh, do uh, donors to do these evaluations. The top research questions that all the when we look at the portfolio of what the evaluations we're looking at, it's one, of course, um, it's what gets everyone um, buy in to the post programs. That's are the long term outcomes and contributions of the program's work among those that, uh, what are the lo uh, long term outcomes and contributions of programs work among those that participated in our programs. Not that we are not necessarily interested in the spillovers or the unintended um, outcomes, but you have to start somewhere. So first you start with your program and then you um, look at the ripple effect. Then uh, the biggest question is like, well, what is being sustained? Are we talking about the outcomes? Are we talking about do people still carry out some of the routinized processes, especially if we are talking about community-led development? Do some of those practices continue without, uh, um, without World Vision pres uh, present? Are there practices or maybe activities that still um, have persisted? Uh, what is the status of the community groups that are left behind and a myriad of other things. But the main question was what is actually being uh, sustained and trying to define it. The last uh, question that is an overall arching question is, have our programs enabled communities to sustain improvement in child well-being? And the reason why uh, child well-being is because it ties to the purpose of the organization and the purpose why we did the pro uh, programs in first place. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, I uh, love uh, this <laughs> picture, but I feel it talks a little bit about the expectations and the enthusiasms that um, uh, uh, come into an organization when you start talking about like, ooh, we should find out what happens after funding ends. There is a genuine um, um, interest in knowing about it. I haven't seen any organization or talked to any of the colleagues who actually um, actually looks um, at um, post-program evaluation and doesn't want to know the answer. But there is a difference in the expectations. Those expectations keep changing the more you do uh, ex post evaluations. So the first, um, I'm a mother um, of a two-year-old and when my um, my husband does this with our child, you know where I stand. Um, I'm definitely, uh, think it's too high, but that's how my expectations from my first expos were. I kept thinking like had this high expectations and as the years uh, started uh, wearing off, my expectations have also temp, um, I would say not necessarily shrunk, but like I am, uh, I feel a lot more grounded uh, on what I expect out of the expos evaluations. Next slide, please. So um, I promised stories. So here is my first story. This is the Zamzam Zam Water Society um, project in Putalam, Sri Lanka. World Vision built the central toll structure. It's the right top corner uh, where if you see my mouse moving, that's where it is, but it's the, the largest picture on the top right. Um, and that is the, uh, the toll structure that World Vision built in 2007. Two years later, uh, the Asian Development Bank uh, built on the investments uh, and provided uh, pumps, pipes, and a tank. And it's uh, mostly inve uh, the investment that you see in the um, central picture that um, it's the, uh, the square shape. World Vision left in 2012. So you have two big um, and uh, non-for-profits and other uh, um, and a donor agency investing in this project in World, uh, World Vision left in 2012. Then later in 2013, the Water uh, Consumer Society that was maintaining the site also dug a 400 feet uh, deep uh, pump. In 2014, the government provided a third water tank. In 2016, uh, World Vision conducted an ex post evaluation and I was on the team. Uh, you can see my feet um, <laughs> at the uh, uh, picture that is at the bottom, but um, not my face there. Um, and we conducted an ex post. What we found is the plant um, right now it's serving 1,700 families. There is a caretaker, one of the gentlemen in the picture, that lives on the premises. The facility is maintained by each family paying for units of water use. Um, I have a poll that um, uh, I'd like to go live, and I would like every one of you to 
express their opinions just based on what I just told you right now. How would you rate uh, this story? Do you think it's a sustainable project or not? Simple question, yes or no. Okay. Howard, we are not seeing the poll. Okay. I just moved it to poll two. Can you see it? I have launched the poll. Just the first question, please. Is this project sustainable? We, I don't see how we can vote. Howard? Uh, you click on the either yes or no. I'm not seeing that as a choice, but maybe because I'm a moderator. That's okay. All three questions have launched. So, well, this is a, a, a process in, in the making. <laughs> Okay, some of you are still thinking it's a trick question, which is fine, because <laughs> uh, they're not sure. But we are having, um, at least no one has said no so far. We'll give it another uh, five seconds. Okay, let's uh, end the polling and um, uh, resume the presentation. Yeah, we have seven, uh, about seven votes that said that the project seems sustainable and we have about four that aren't necessarily sure about um, um, where the story is going. To those of you that were wise and actually uh, said that they weren't sure, maybe the additional information that I'll give you will help you make, uh, make your mind whether this, uh, the, the project was actually um, sustainable. Um, Howard, are you sharing the screen? Um, the... Okay, so the next slide, please. Well, what happens is that um, I was there um, and got really excited about uh, the project because you see all of this investment uh, that it's going, that has been going, and you see that there is definitely a community, um, uh, not only participation, but maintaining of, uh, um, of the facility. They have a water, um, water committee that runs it, they have uh, a caretaker, everyone, uh, they have a system of paying um, um, by units of water con uh, consumed. They definitely have enough of a scale because they have a th about 1,700 families that it serves. So with that excitement, I ran to the, um, uh, <laughs> this water tap actually, where uh, these uh, kids were playing, and I sat down to take a sip of water. I was like, this is great. Well, I hear this shrieking on the background saying like, stop, stop. And I was told the water, it's not for drinking. I could not be more confused. <laughs> this is like something that actually, um, when I look at, not only has there been investment during the time that World Vision um, is there, but has there been investment after World Vision left and has there been investment from the community themselves? And is the community actually maintaining and using um, the, uh, the investment? And the answer is yes. Yes, uh, but the water is not for what we thought was gonna be used um, at, at start. So we are not gonna launch that other poll um, because um, of time and the technology, but I'd love if you put in the chat whether this changes your uh, mind on whether the project is sustainable or not. And if you change your mind, you were a yes, 
and now are unsure, I would love to go through the chat um, afterwards or Yindra and Isabella, please monitor and uh, you can respond to it. But I can tell you how I, um, I felt uh, and the, what was my takeaway from the story. The takeaway from the story for me was that uh, sustainability lies in the eye of the beholder. Um, if I were a, um, a technical um, person looking primarily at what did the project, what was the project supposed to do in 2007 from a world vision, and um, if it was a project that was supposed to provide uh, drinkable water to um, this particular um, community, then I would mark this as a no. But if my judgment is um, on the other tangible sides of is what is the community maintaining, regardless of how I feel about like what is being maintained, whether it's good or not, the answer would be yes. They are definitely doing community-led uh, development. They are continuing on their own. They are, they are convincing enough that they have brought in more investment and um, running the facility, even though the sustainability does not look um, like I wanted it to look. So let's look at another uh, story. Um, but before we go there, I, um, uh, I'd also like to point out that the sto uh, this story is one of the many that comes from, uh, there were some questions about methodology. When we set out to do this evaluation in this, um, in, of this program in um, Sri Lanka, uh, there was a quantitative arm. Everyone is interested on like, what were the results among our uh, participants on different aspects, education, health, uh, food security. And that becomes what consumes the time of an evaluator like myself. Uh, then we had an add-on activity, which was the GIS uh, component, where we asked uh, a group of people to go and measure through GIS, um, uh, look at um, back then, uh, and it's only four years ago, we had to go with the phones and drop a pin where all the sites were and do a simple questionnaire. I happened to join the GIS group um, that day. I always wonder if um, I had if I had not joined um, the group and if this if I hadn't gone to actually drink the water, if I would have stumbled upon this um, dual nature of what you actually consider sustainability. So do not dismiss uh, methods and do not dismiss any of the uh, smaller scale, uh, unassuming add-on methodology. What would make a difference in when you're looking for sustainability is are you looking for it? Are you actually looking for it? So do not only rely on the methodology to do the, uh, the job for you, dropping the pin of the GIS and having a survey, but inquire that the people that are actually going are interested, um, interested um, to find uh, what's sustainable, even if it's not looking like what the survey is uh, it's looking at, the same domains. The next question. The, sorry, next slide, last question. <laughs> okay, this is this, another story, and I titled this one, Talk About Resilience. This is the story of an interpersonal psychotherapy uh, groups that, are, um, that were established in Uganda. The gentleman here, it's one of the facilitators. Um, uh, he joined this interpersonal, um, I'll, I'll call them IPTG, the IPTGs um, as a member of a group in 2005. And in 2007, he became a facilitator and started three groups um, by himself. Two of them were still very active uh, in the entire area in 2016. Behind um, at his house um, are all the books, records, the attendance, the lists, um, um, uh, the constitutions, any necessary document that he has from the groups. And it's amazing. He has the original training uh, manuals. Now, what's amazing about um, this IPTGs comes in the next, next slide. Can you click through all of them um, since we're, uh, we don't have the- Exactly. So. Holta, so, we're, yeah. we're running out of time. So I'm going to just encourage you. Okay. to summarize okay. a bit more. So can you uh, go through the next slide? Uh, sorry, the next, here. So uh, what I want you to recall from uh, uh, this group is that the gr this group was, um, um, the intervention was a low cost, high effective community-based intervention aimed at the reduction of depress depression um, among those that um, 
had um, HIV positive status in the Rakai Kakuto program in uh, Uganda. The model was designed uh, and tested and validated through John Hopkins. In 2006, there was another um, first ex post, I would say, that was done by, just, by Johns Hopkins to, uh, to say how long should they, we expect the, uh, the results to, to last. And it says, it said it was successful six months after the conclusion of the formal interventions, people showed less uh, um, depression among those that participated in the groups. The groups were given a choice to remain together or dissolve. The project was successful. What we find out is that many of those groups for, uh, for, uh, formed early on on this particular interventions chose to remain. At program closure, World Vision, when World Vision exited the community, it left behind 23 of these groups. Columbia University uh, did an investigation and found out um, two months before World Vision exited and found out that uh, those um, groups um, actually delivered uh, improved school attendance for children um, of participants, improved productivity in agriculture, uh, improved sanitation, greater cohesion, and reduced conflict. World Vision left. When we go in 2016, we do not know. We only know there are 23 of them, but we can't find out where they are. We do not know much about the group, so we have to contact everyone else uh, that had done studies before us. There is no sustainable definition on preset benchmarks of what success looks like for these groups. Is it about uh, sustaining mental health or is it about this other uh, non-mental health or mental health uh, related but additional uh, benefits? Next slide. Um, you will read more about this methodology, but it was primarily um, tracking who we could. We, at the end, ended up by word of mouth finding seven, the, uh, seven of these groups. And we did free listing with facilitators, members, and then some triangulation with uh, referrals, adults uh, knowledgeable about uh, the changes that we were, that the members were recording so that we could have a third, almost like a third party that validated their responses. Next slide. The IPT groups existed much longer than expected from the model. Think about the six months in 2004, 2005, or 2006 when they were created. All seven groups tracked were still operational in 2015, 2016. Four of the groups had been operational for over a decade. Three appear to have uh, formed towards the last two years of our program, so that means that uh, the project was also replicating groups. Groups have evolved in terms of membership and group size. It started, remember, as a um, support for depression, but there is changes that have happened to who they accept now in the, uh, in the groups. All groups continue to offer the psychosocial services to their members on a case by cases, but they no longer hold their sessions like they used to. Um, the core activities for all groups currently revolve around income generation and supporting each other. Uh, next one. When we did the same exercises that uh, Columbia University did, the top three, improved economic situation, improved child education, and group cohesion still remain true uh, five years after. Can we, um, can we uh, go to the next slide? I have uh, a next slide. You, um, you will have this presentation so you can go on the actual um, quotes that came from these groups, but uh, I like um, to, and on the group cohesion. What we ended up uh, as an evaluation group ended up landing on, on why these groups were su uh, su um, successful in ways that no one projected from six months uh, life to over a decade of life. Most of the members in this group usually, or even oftentimes share their disappointments with each other. They also share their joys and achievements. Members have formed friendships with other members of the group and help each other where need be and also share about their daily ex um, experiences. What makes this group unique, it's how they have forged trust in how they were built and how they actually have formed a group cohesion that can withstand dec um, a decade of uh, what, came, uh, what came to them without much of intervention from organizations like um, my own. Can we go to the next slide? High level learning beyond just hunting for good results. 
you will find as an evaluator, if you ever embark on this journey, that there are no uh, benchmarks to measure success on sustainability or set expectations for how long should something last. Is seven groups out of the 23 that I just mentioned a good enough? Yes or no will be very subjective. But that subjectivity will be removed the longer we talk about it because other groups will be measured, other organizations will, be do, will do it, and we will start to norm around some benchmarks of how long should things last and um, what is that sustainability look like? But that won't come without the pressure of continuous measurement, reflection, and learning. Create a stronger link between sustainability, resilience, transitions, and community-led uh, development from start to uh, post-end. Don't start with just the exports. Use the first exports so that your next uh, iteration of projects be, uh, should be better. Start with the end for uh, the need for learning, not, ju not just accountability and extend your toolbox with more than just, um, with, uh, more than just uh, uh, one mindset of we have to have an RCT as the gold standard for measuring whether things are sustainable or not. There is a place for that, but there is more, uh, more to it. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, we should is, be wrapping up, yes, so there's time the for questions. This is the sharing, the last one. Um, the source, uh, this is from the World Food Program. And um, it's, um, I wouldn't say a license, but an advice to look at multiple sources for building sustainability. Do not get married to only one of the methods. There are something that every one of the methods can actually teach us about sustainability. What I shared uh, um, from you included some of my personal experiences and some of the documented of anecdotal evidence and some of the qualitative impact learnings. Okay, I'll, uh, you can uh, share the next slide and I can look at the chat and for questions. Thank you for um, bearing with me. Uh, Great. Yuna, Rizabella, can you do a summary of some of the questions uh, as I go through to chat? Sure, so Isabella, um, do you want to deal with, um, uh, Ernest, would you like to restate your question and, um, and uh, Isabella, say what you what you answered. I thought it was terrific. If folks can't see the chat, um, sure. Ernest asked. Let me just. Ernest asked, um, does the aspect of unintended consequences in his question positive consequences qualify to make it a, to make an intervention sustainable? And I just offered an initial response, and I'd, I'd love to hear you hold your thoughts as well. I um, I think the answer to that depends on how we understand how change happens, our understanding of just the change processes. Um, is it really a rigidly planned, predetermined linear process in which we can almost clinically approach that um, the measurement? Or does it require <clears throat> more complex adaptive systems-based understanding of such processes? And I have met evaluators who look at unintended effects, both positive and negative, as an important element in, in understanding sustainability. So I wanted to hear your thoughts, Olga. Yeah, that, I, I love this. I tend to be um, on the side of, um, um, I, I tend to be on the side of thinking that right now we do not know enough of sustainability. We have thoughts about sustainability. Uh, we still, as I said, we do not know if 50% success of community groups two years after a project ends should be successful or no. If when I ask people to vote and I said, um, if I say it's 50% uh, success, 50% uh, of the community groups have remained, is it good or not? The answer means to be like, eh, not so good. But why? How do we know it's not so good? <laughs> Maybe uh, uh, under the current, the concept of uh, the context where we are measuring, even that 50%, it's a great success. Um, we tend to go with the numbers that seem to be like 80% of the groups are successful or 90% of the groups are successful as something that that, as if that is the one that determines what, sustain, uh, what sustainability should look like. So those benchmarks need to be challenged and they cannot be challenged by a linear looking. So specifically um, looking for unintended consequences and um, 
especially positive or negative, and being upfront about your find will only contribute to us probably in the future having a clearer picture about um, uh, sustainability. So yes, that's, that'll be Wonderful. my take. So I'm going to have two questions, um, Holta. One is um, Michelle Leroy asked a really good question. So it says, he thought the presentation was uh, very interesting and he says, sustainability is linked to the concept of future and time has a different meaning in different cultural spheres. How to address this issue in ex post evaluation? And then uh, Becky asked, what are comms colleagues? And I thought comms was communications, the PR outreach staff in World Vision. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Michelle, I, um, I agree that uh, the, uh, what time uh, means to people, it's something that um, we, we are trying to, um, here's my take. My take is whenever we end projects and we do a lot of exit strategies, uh, fancy strategies about exit uh, nowadays, or even think about sustainability plans, we don't normally ask the people in the, um, in the, um, that are supposed to sustain those, uh, whether it's outcomes or groups, what do they, how long do they think these things will last? How, uh, and let the timing definition come from them, but also challenge their thinking because of, obviously we want things to last longer, the good things to last as long as possible. Bring examples of how things are relevant or not. One of the questions that I asked uh, this group uh, that I shared on IP, uh, the IPDGs, I asked them at the end, the question was, is this group still relevant? This group was formed out of uh, depression coming out of, um, of being, having an HIV AIDS status and not that HIV AIDS has been er eradicated, but there have been a decade of coping with it and there are programs and there are mechanisms and there is an adjustment period. Is this group still needed? And they said yes, but they also pointed out to what was relevant of the group. And they felt that being part of the group had taught them about caring of, uh, for people that are uh, orphans, uh, for children that are orphans. And they, there is a beautiful quote that I have included that I'd love for you to read, which um, in their voice explains what relevance is, which is that actually um, orphans and people in need, kids in need will always be there. So they felt that as a group, they even with the little means that they had, they could still continue to contribute. To me, as long as the group can, finds a meaning and relevance in their sustainability in their own defined way, they have, they have defined sustainability in a time bound way that it's um, different from what I would have said, six months post program, you're good to go. And may I ask Isabella to comment on this question of time as well, and then I'll say a word as well. Um, you know, I actually was planning to do that as part of the uh, Oxfam India story. So I can come back to this with an example there, just how understanding of those downstream impacts was in fact related to time passing and other things changing in a society, but it's an excellent question. And it also reminds me of other almost, you know, philosophical questions that some evaluators have to um, struggle with. For example, one, that uh, relates to a lot of uh, faith-based organizations, uh, especially local small organizations uh, or religious groups that do not understand linear uh, planning and do not understand success and impact in the same way um, than some external evaluators who uh, descend to, to evaluate their work. Uh, because they are motivated by a much uh, longer term horizon and they understand change as happening in a very different um, you know, way uh, and not just um, um, driven by us. So I think I'll come back to parts of that um, in, in my comments as well. Indra, go ahead. Thank you, Isabella. I have a great story for this. So the very, well, I did a one post project in Niger 10 years ago, but it was really kind of a delayed final and then we tacked on sustainability and there were lots of interesting lessons. But the, the one that blew me away 
was um, how many cultural blinders we will sometimes have, we evaluators, when we only focus on our project's uh, success. So the project in CRS uh, uh, Niger, Catholic Relief Services Niger, was they were feeding themselves one third more three years after. Unheard of, unheard of. Um, granted, the rains had been good. Um, they, CRS had an absolutely excellent uh, process of phasing out, uh, phasing over to the local um, local government and local private sector in terms of who was buying the agricultural produce. They spent a whole year doing it. It was really amazing work. Um, but in terms of uh, the trainings, I suddenly was standing in a crowd of maybe 60 young women. We had done a focus group of youth of young women having to do with the maternal child health. And three years out, um, I was talking to the elders who said, yes, you know, we know the messages, we retain the messages. And we went to the uh, young women and we said, have you heard these breastfeeding messages? And only the girls whose mothers had been part of the program had. The ones who had not been part of the program, had never heard the breastfeeding, complementary feeding, how to rehabilitate a child who is malnourished. And so it speaks only three years out, there were new mothers that were young girls young or young women that no one planned that they would then need these messages. There was no funding, there was no support for them to continue. So for me, the whole concept of for how long is it sustainable and with whom, um, the community was, was quite embarrassed because they were like, oh, well, we didn't actually, we just assumed they would just kind of learn from the crowd of their peers. And so just systematizing support over the long term, focusing on capacity building of the communities to sustain this, this behavior change is really important. And so um, I will uh, now say just one quick uh, question, I think. Um, uh, is there anything else to hold tight? This communications question is a very important one. So yeah, can you I, deal with that? And then yeah. I'll, we'll, in about a uh, minute, we'll move on to Isabella. I was actually just putting it on, um, um, on the chat. So it will be there. We can move to Isabella. Um, so I just want to say one thing. Um, one of the difficulties, uh, as I alluded to in the expos that was very unsuccessful, um, when you share when things have not gone well. I have learned to see like Lutheran World Relief, there were really mixed results and they not only shared them, but they actually said, here's how we're going to address three of them. Um, that for me is why they're really uh, learning champions because, and USAID has shared water projects and they have said, and one water project for Madagascar was an unmitigated disaster. They are worse off as a result of the water project um, than they were before the, uh, the, the CRS care and a couple of others came. So, you know, the more we learn, the more we stop doing what doesn't work. A whole touch, you want to say something else? Yeah, before? I just put it uh, uh, in the chat. Um, as I said, the expectations from uh, post-program evaluations are really high at the beginning because everyone is expecting these wonderful results to come in. So there isn't a plan B for communications. They haven't thought through how to share um, findings as they come and how to actually put the learning um, as part of the image of, uh, of the organization. This image is um, uh, when we look at like um, the competition that exists between organizations for funding, we are both buddies in this <laughs> uh, struggle, but we also compete for funding. And that kind of camp competition tends to lend more to like, look at how great we are, we are greater, uh, we're doing better, we're doing this. This won't be shaken as a, um, as a mechanism of how funding um, uh, um, comes in an organization if we do not also involve work internally with those people that create the image. And uh, there is a lot of education that needs to come uh, along with that, a lot of education and a little bit of peer pressure. So I'm definitely gonna um, lean on to what Lutheran World Relief has done um, and also Yindra, what you post on Valuing Voices to push my organization to be a lot more uh, open for about this mixed back stories, like the first one that I had, 
is it sustainable or not? Well, it's, isn't it better that everybody learns from it and we know something more about sustainability? Absolutely. Wonderful. Holta, thank you so much. That's just great. So off we go to Isabella. Thank you, Yindra. And um, I'm not controlling the slides, so I'm just waiting for them to come up. Great. So I'd like to uh, build on uh, excellent points that Yindra and Holta already made and um, add to them um, primarily from the perspective of local communities as well as local organizations. Um, not so much on the methodology in this case, um, but I think you've heard some excellent examples and, and um, resources from both of them already. And one of the reasons why I'm focusing on this is because there are so many different ways that this externally funded, externally driven efforts are perceived are understood and judged by those on the receiving end of this effort. And when we're not there to understand how those perceptions shift and evolve and what else happens downstream, um, especially after some time has passed, we are missing um, the nuances which are harder to capture um, in a short visit. And I myself struggle when my visits are only um, you know, two weeks long in a particular context. And um, while we speak, my colleagues and I try to speak to as many people as we can to get the wider picture of what happened here. Um, it's almost never enough. So next slide, please. Um, I'll start with just a summary of the most relevant lessons that um, my colleagues and I laid out in the Time to Listen book, which was mentioned earlier, Nicole. Um, I wish I could say that eight years after publication of this book, um, these lessons were no longer relevant, but unfortunately they still ring true um, very loudly in, in many contexts. And we haven't yet um, you know, up, uprooted um, the many uh, difficult challenges in our um, broader aid system. So a lot of the lessons that we captured during the listening project, uh, which culminated in this publication, are still very relevant today. And I just laid out a few of the most relevant ones here. I won't read all of them, and um, I'd like to focus on the fact that quite often the externally driven um, assistance efforts as we describe in a book and as they feel um, to those on the receiving end, they fail to um, engage people in, in the local context as subjects in their own change story in their communities and societies progress and treat them as objects um, and recipients, passive recipients quite often in other people's you know, decision-making and planning impacts them more than their own ideas and priorities. And um, you know, we do call for a really important change in, in how this should be done, including um, ways that local assets and local capacities um, need to be understood, need to be acknowledged and recognized and build on. And the problem is that we have over the last several decades ossified into a system that looks at gaps and needs to be filled instead of recognizing existing capacities and structures that need to be reinforced instead of actually using more of a community organizing approach and having the local communities um, truly generate and articulate what the priorities and um, you know and, and issues are and how they would want to work on them whereas the outsiders become just a support mechanism. So um, in summary, I just want to say that while this was not an evaluation, we did ask in 20 countries around the world and engage 6, 000, more, more than 6,000 people in these conversations, we did ask the cumulative impact, impact question and we tried to understand how people judge the impacts and they do that based on whether or not what was provided, what was built, what was, you know, uh, how they were engaged, if all of that, in fact, improved the likelihood of a secure livelihood. So things like roads, did they 
open markets? Did they actually open new opportunities? Did water um, projects and irrigation projects allow for improvement in crops? Did schools and training lead to employment or productive skills? So the downstream effects sometimes are impossible to fully understand unless you return and apply um, various methods and engage people in conversations as Andrew and Holter were talking about. Next slide, please. So I included a couple of direct voices here and I, um, I'll just read one of them, but some of the ways that community members and government officials remarked all across the globe, um, I won't list all 20 countries, but we, um, we did a very um, uh, diverse, you know, uh, geographical spread in all of our listening exercises and visited uh, Latin America, Africa, um, South Asia, East Asia, and Eastern Europe as well. And it was incredible how consistent the voice uh, of the, um, and the experiences uh, of the aid recipients were from government officials to local organizations, community-based organizations to individuals, from Aceh, Indonesia, to Bolivia, to Angola, to Kosovo, completely different contexts. And yet the cumulative analysis was very consistent and very, um, easily um, recognized as patterns um, in how um, the international aid system has failed. And where we missed the mark on sustainability is one of the things that was mentioned consistently was the rapidly shifting agendas that undermine sustainability. And you have a um, quote here from a government official. And another one is that sustainability, um, at least in the past, I hope it's changing now, was delinked somehow and understood as separate from participation and ownership. Um, I, do, I do hope that there are a lot more bright spots and um, things are changing in that, um, in that regard. But to expect sustainability where everything was decided, managed, implemented uh, with the help of outsiders, uh, with very little engagement and then just handed over uh, or left behind for people to manage um, was, was a consistent critique um, in a lot of these efforts. I know that the slides will be shared later, so I, I'll, I left the quotes here for people to read. Another thing I would mention is Project Titus, just the fact that this isn't really about projects, it's about people, it's about local capacities and local um, you know, desired changes that can in fact evolve with time. And yet we have sort of fallen into this project mentality or projectitis as many people have called it out, uh, which lacks long-term vision. Um, and people called out how much money was wasted with this short-term thinking, um, how, mu how much investment was made and how little um, was actually seen in the end. Um, next slide, please. And just on that point alone, a consistent and repeated um, sincere question that was asked in all across this context where we listened openly was, why don't they ever come back? Why would they invest that much money and effort and not check on what happens? And it was incredible to hear just what people offered in terms of when, when we actually asked them, why do you think they don't come back? And what do you think is happening here? Um, there was an utter and sincere um, disappointment and disbelief that uh, organizations that spend a considerable amount of time and again, investments, financial resources, efforts, would not want to know what happened. Um, and not just check on whether things are happening exactly as planned, but what else happened and how the communities are doing. For them, it was truly about relationship that was somehow severed after these projects were completed and people left. Um, and some expressed the genuine expectation that the um, staff, um, or you know, people that they've met during the project um, life cycle that they will come back uh, in a number of places. I've heard that expectation and hope. And it was very sincere in, for example, in an example in a Thai village that was reconstructed after the tsunami, 
and the logo of the organization that paid for that reconstruction was actually imprinted on every single house in that village. And when I asked them, why, um, how do you feel about this? What is this about? Um, why, why is there a same logo on every single house here in your village? They said, oh, um, they left it behind so that they can come back and visit us one day. And it was by then, um, six or seven years later, nobody had come back. Um, at all, but they were still waiting and hoping, and they wanted the relationship. They wanted to show how they've grew the they, they've grown the village, how um, they've built more in it, how they have taken um, a lot of the initial investments and what they've done with it. Um, next slide, please. So I wanted to give uh, give you one example of um, this you know, sustainability of outcomes down the stream and understanding unintended negative and positive impacts um, after some time has passed. And this is based on Oxfam International's listening exercise, which they commissioned outside of the listening project and asked me to facilitate in January 2012. So seven years after the tsunami response. And it was an unusual exercise. It was not an evaluation, but an open-ended um, exercise using the listening methodology um, to visit um, many of the sites where six Oxfam affiliates deployed and responded to the tsunami in, to, in um, late 2004 and early 2005. Um, and I did that with their um, former local partners with whom they had not worked ever since. Um, so it was uh, um, an exercise in relationship rebuilding as well, and then jointly listening all up and down the Tamil Nadu coast, uh, where a lot of fishing villages and other um, towns and communities were wiped out um, by, by the tsunami and a lot of destruction uh, and assets were lost. And, and so as we went down, um, all the way down the coast and listened to communities, that have experienced that aid seven years earlier, the picture became a lot more um, interesting as people reflected on changes that they've seen. Just as an example, um, they talked about the changes in cultural and social norms, which were tied to the changes in the demand, uh, in the demand equation in the labor market. And to explain this, um, you have to understand that uh, several Oxfam affiliates provided boats uh, because this was the asset that was lost in the disaster and boats were provided to a lot of the communities that used to fish, but also to some communities that never used to fish, were not um, a fishing cast, um, as well as boats given to people in the same communities where um, not everybody used to own a boat and suddenly now many more people did. And so the labor equation changed by virtue of um, the previously available labor that was hired on the boats um, was now not available. And the fishermen, um, by, um, by needing to have more people with them fishing every day, had to reach out and engage the members of the castes that used to not be allowed to fish before. Um, so none of this was in the program design, as you can imagine, none of these changes in social norms and cultural norms um, that in fact a lot of the uh, lower caste people who used to not to be able to fish uh, talked about it as a development that had significant psychological effects and was linked to their sense of dignity, respect and social inclusion. Um, when a humanitarian organization arrives and, and, and does asset replacement kind of strategy, like, oh, you used to have a boat, here's a boat. You, you had fishing nets that you lost, here's fishing nets. And then they try to also, on top of it, do a rights-based development approach and spread the resources to other groups that used to be marginalized. They don't always, pre they can't predict always and um, imagine all of the different effects downstream. And the picture was mixed. Um, too many boats also caused overfishing. The boats that people got were suddenly not just the wooden dugout um, catamarans that they are used to, but they were fiberglass GPS powered motorized boats. Um, 
that caused all sorts of environmental and all sorts of other effects down the stream, which seven years later um, were a lot easier to see and understand. And not all of them were negative. There was a lot of gray area in terms of um, who suddenly fished and what happened and women were able to fish for the first time and so on. Then another uh, decision that they made was to grant joint property titles uh, to the houses that were reconstructed in those villages, which was a stark change to the traditional practice. Um, before that, mostly men were, uh, were holders of the property titles. And a lot of women recalled that that was um, a major contributor to power dynamics in the family. And, Sometimes the male members of the family could just put the house up um, either in a bedding, um, you know, or they could sell it and leave the family homeless if they uh, felt like it. And so when the joint property titles were in, um, actively promoted and instituted by several aid agencies, including Oxfam, um, that became an interesting um, new practice that the local government as well picked up. And um, the NGOs were successful in lobbying the government to have the legal deeds uh, to the houses be arranged, sometimes in the name of the woman only. Um, and a number of people referred to this development as a significant cultural change, which had effects on the nature of decision making in the households and the power dynamics in the family as well. So there's lots of lots of stories. It's um, um, the, re the full report that lays out what we heard in that listening exercise is online on Oxfam's website and the link to it is um, in the slides, but I can also drop it into the chat if that's helpful. Um, this is just to demonstrate that if we had gone back um, just a year later after the tsunami um, response had officially ended, we would not have heard or understood the complexity and the multi-layered changes, unintended, intended, positive, negative, environmental, social, um, uh, you know, all sorts of other changes. And this is not to say that uh, some of these changes were not critiqued. A lot of the uh, women groups in Tamil Nadu that we met with as well um, did say that it's, um, you can't just socially engineer some of this with a rights-based development approach and a humanitarian timetable, and that these were important developments that need to be understood in, in a contributional analysis way uh, against all sorts of other advocacy and social changes that are were happening already in the Indian society and are continue to happen to this day. So obviously a much more complex systemic picture that we just captured a snippet on. And I just have one more slide left, um, if you could. Yes, thank you. Um, so on sustainability of local institutions, uh, you know, a related, um, but a, an important separate uh, story that needs to be understood as well. Uh, as part of a recent learning consortium called Stopping a Success, uh, my colleagues and I looked at what happens when international NGOs leave the country after often many years in the country um, and what sorts of um, sustainability planning processes and exit strategies and transition planning um, and responsible transition planning processes have been um, tried and implemented and what can we learn from them, especially from the perspective of local institutions that either were there already and were local partners to these INGOs or some local institutions that were created as a result of um, the international organization sort of setting up a spin-off organization or uh, inspiring the former national staff to start a brand new entity, a social enterprise or a, a new organization. So all sorts of examples um, we have 20 case studies on that and the website is um, in the slides as well. I'll, I'll drop it into the chat. Um, so what did we learn there in terms of sustainability of institutions? It's obviously a, a number of different uh, lessons related to organizational sustainability um, and asking uh, important questions about what, what matters. Is that there is an organization standing after INGOs leave? But what if the organization is not legitimate or not accountable and so on? It's not, we're not just looking at shells of 
organizations or mini me versions of NGOs who that um, keep going uh, and reproduce some of the challenges of the aid sector I talked about earlier. We looked at legitimate um, and uh, reputable organizations that continue some of the legacy of their um, international partners, uh, but also are paving the way for whatever is currently important and needed in the society. So in some cases, like in Bosnia, it looked like a microfinance institution that um, has now been standing um, completely independently for 20 years after Mercy Corps, an American NGO, um, basically helped it uh, to register as a, as a Bosnian independent entity out of a small economic development project that Mercy Corps started in late 90s. And it's an incredible story of change and evolution and local leadership that I, um, you know, I hope that other organizations can learn from. Um, we looked at spin-off organizations as well as organizations that were um, led by community members forward uh, or projects that became community driven entirely after the initial funding from outside. Um, and I think the one important uh, element here that echoes what Yindra and Holter were saying is early and joint planning for any sort of exit um, uh, you know, planning, sustainability planning is really key. Um, some of the not so successful exits that we have seen or heard about were abrupt, were irresponsible in a sense that local organizations were just expected to catch whatever was left, hand, you know, handovers were done in uh, very abrupt and uh, poorly planned ways, uh, or international organizations exited so rapidly that um, everything really crashed and, and did, you know, was not sustained at all. So in our choice of positive deviant kind of um, selection of success stories uh, of exits that were done well, we saw that um, the early and joint planning was really important. But even in cases where that wasn't done, even where there wasn't an articulated exit strategy from there really early on, um, the fact that local, national um, institutions, national staff sometimes um, stepped in and engaged in the process of uh, planning, articulating what that next phase will be for the organization and what the priorities and, and mandate and mission should be um, was incredibly important. That it, it, even in cases where exits were defined by um, headquarters or boards of organizations deciding when to pull the funding or the priorities shifting, geographic priorities shifting, the local actors were really the ones who stepped in and were able to shape that next phase. Yendra, um, I'm not sure how I'm, I'm doing on time, but I'm happy to stop here and just take questions. That is terrific. You were reading my mind. So um, we're going to have just under 15 minutes to chat about Isabella's and then we're going to have a quick poll and then kind of a, you know, a feedback to us across our three presentations. So we finish by four. Um, so my question is, uh, there were two terrific questions um, from, um, hold on one second, from uh, Alabana. Uh, so I'll, I asked a question, you know, kind of how well do those people on the on the webinar that work in global development, how well do they return? And Albana Spiro uh, said, seeing, you know, change, two things come to mind, seeing change in a projectized way leads to thinking that work ends when the project ends and no funding is available for going back. And then it's also the understanding that the contribution is seen as part of the bigger change, the duty bearers and local organizations are the ones to take over. Passing on the stick, if it had started from the start, there may be going back, uh, can be done by the duty bearers and the local organizations. And then Becky, so I would love uh, Isabella to comment on that. And then Becky said, uh, she found that sustainability is difficult due to changes in NGO staffing, budget structures, so five to 10 years on organizations can look very different. They have different priorities. 
then they re reproduce similar programs without learning from the original ones, wasted funds quite often. Uh, we seek to change this. So, um, Isabella, what are your thoughts about either the, you know, the local folks taking over or really the NGOs changing? Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely, Albana, I agree with you. And, and I think there's been a solid critique of that projectized ways of thinking about development and breaking it up into these discrete projects and um, very rarely asking the question of how is this all adding up? What's the cumulative impact of many, many, many different disconnected projects? And we attempted to ask some of those questions during the listening project. So, you know, asking where in your lives are we making a difference? Um, so there's been a vaccination campaign and then there's been a goat project and a school books project and irrigation project and, you know, all of this, <laughs> that are, you know, that just come and go and pass through like weather, right, through, through this community. <laughs> um, and we just wanted to step back and not discuss any single project, but just ask that question how, how is this all adding up in your lives how, how are your lives different because of um this various um efforts that you've seen or maybe hopefully participated in directly and it's true that it does feel disconnected as it does to us as we're discussing it here it it feels very disconnected and bizarre sometimes to um, people um, obviously on the receiving end of this. And I, I, I absolutely agree with the duty bearers and local organizations are the ones to be also at some point um, held accountable for how they are driving these processes forward and for them to speak up and get engaged early if they are not being engaged, if they're not invited to, um, to, you know, to the decision making table. That's a huge power dynamics issue, which, you know, um, has also been critiqued in so many places, but um, local organizations need to um, obviously also show both to the communities that they serve and to other actors in the system that they are accountable and they need to claim their space um, at, at that decision making table. Um, and, and Isabella, uh, Becky had talked about the fact that uh, NGOs change and now Albana has talked about local institutions evolve over time and there are wider policy changes in a country and they, they just follow the funding sometimes and how do they you know deviate to shape themselves you know how do we judge the sustainability and I think that's a terrific question for both I mean all of us could talk about it but really Isabella and Holta have addressed this in their evaluations. Yes and in the case studies that we did on uh, responsible transitions and what sort of what happens after international organizations leave the country entirely and to be clear in some cases relationships are maintained of course and there's some collaboration some solidarity and but physically when local organizations are the ones driving the agenda forward um, on some of these long-term development issues uh, we clearly see that they are thinking about evolution and adaptation to what's needed. And even in the case of that microfinance organization that I mentioned in Bosnia, which was an uh, incredibly successful case of completely locally led for, you know, for the last 20 years and very successful in, as, on organizational metrics, let's put it this way. It has grown, it is providing uh, microcredit to so many people, it has maintained its um, uh, focus on supporting financial inclusion for women and marginalized groups and so on. But my question to them was, so what's your exit strategy? Um, if 20 years later we're still on really tiny microloans and so many people are leaving Bosnia because of lack of employment, um, how are these organizations thinking about themselves at, at, in the future? You know, what, it, it's not just the success story, it's not just they're still standing and they're operating, but what is their contribution to that long-term development um, challenge? Holta, um, you, probably, you probably have some things to say on that as well. 
I'll go back to the, uh, to the relevance um, and how long do we expect things to last? And I am tired of thinking that <laughs> we want things to last forever. That is not how the world ends. That is not how we, um, as people, work. We work in relationships, we evolve, we change. So what is relevant? And it is okay for something to end if it's no longer relevant and give space to something else. So judging whether things stayed the same or how we left them and making that the judgment of sustainability is what gets us in that idea of failure rather than looking at how did things evolve and was, is there a relevance, is there a space that was, uh, um, that um, uh, it's left because an organ uh, a small local organization did not make it. Uh, but it was still relevant. Those are the lessons that we want to uh, struggle and learn uh, from. So that issue of relevance, bringing relevance back to forefront of uh, is this needed is what we would uh, like, I would like to have uh, exposed to focus on. So I, I just want to say something. One of the things that I think Exposed shows us, the things that are not sustained by communities are not relevant to them. Sometimes, you know, they, they, we saw road building. They're like, we sh you know, you paid us with food to build a road. Um, this is the government's job to build the road. We're happy for your food. We're not gonna keep doing it because it's hard labor and, you know, the use of incentives in development aid programming is really pernicious. Um, and I also think that once you start to learn what was sustained and why, very often the, the activities that I see things being sustained are those that generate a continued stream of revenue and benefits to the communities. What is sustained are the agriculture projects, the microenterprise projects, the health projects, because they continue to see a benefit from it. And we need to look at our development programming. Some activities potentially don't need to be sustained. Maybe it's great. Maybe you just needed that dam built and you're done. And now it's genuinely the government's job to sustain it. This is not always a community responsibility. Um, but, I, but I definitely think that filter of relevance uh, that's come up is incredibly important. But I also wanna say, we're not off the hook. We can't just say, oh, we don't do these kinds of projects. We've been feeding children for 50 years. We've been helping agricultural yields for 50 years. We can't just say, oh, so we're doing drip irrigation as compared to bunding, so you can't evaluate our project because we do it differently. I'm like, well, the details may slightly differ, but we're still doing hundreds of thousands of similar projects and we're not learning from them, as somebody said. Um, so uh, I think it's now time for, it's now 45. So um, would you, Howard, would you please post the poll? And then we would love some feedback on takeaways from you guys. So Howard, can you post the poll and we'll get some feedback and then we'll have final comments. Howard? Yes, is the Excellent. poll launched? Yeah, okay. I believe the poll should be now launched. And I'm just going to use my moderator's uh, microphone to say, you know, put pressure on the local authorities to maintain it. That is absolutely important. Um, ideally, it's in partnership with donors that continue to encourage uh, people to uh, governments to continue those resources or other donors to come over or partnerships with private sector or um yeah so so yeah give us evaluate us how do we do good also to Alvana, um one thing is to yes the communities in some of those projects should continue to put pressure but the po point of an evaluator is um, to understand was this clear to them when they signed up for uh, for it did um what are the reasons if they did sign up for it that things are not happening 
a lot of things and pressures happen and um, from an evaluator perspective that would help a lot of these kinds of programs uh, to better design next time um, once they understand why people did not um, follow through with some of the um, maybe commitments that they made and maybe the answer is they never signed up for a continued commitment to it they signed up for that one period in time And then we have uh, Albana talking about the legitimacy and need for the project. Sorry, I agree on the legitimacy and need for the project in order to have full awareness on the short and long term, short benefit and longer term benefit. Does anyone of our team want to comment on that? And so far, good, we're happy. We see 83% of people find it very useful and 17% find it somewhat useful, but that's, that's a relief. Um, let's end uh, 16, 80%, 80 and 20, wonderful. And no one found it not useful. So that's, that's wonderful. And um, uh, so let's end it. Uh, and so what are the takeaways? Holta, do you wanna, do you wanna leave this? Yes, uh, we have just a few minutes. So in the interest of time, uh, please do not skip um, uh, this, this part. If you were to, with everything, uh, maybe the things that we shared and also the things that we did not share that you wanted to hear, what is the key takeaway from you? When you think of your, um, the place where you are in life, the uh, work that you do, what is one thing that you want to do um, because of uh, participating here? And it might be nothing, it's fine. You can also say, I want to go and grab a cup of coffee. I've been sitting here for two hours. Uh, but please do voice um, your opinions on what would be like something that you can take away from this. It will help us tremendously, not only um, to know how to do things better for uh, next time, but I can guarantee that when you put things in writing, there's a little bit more commitment in you as well to follow through. So we'll give you about um, two minutes it has to be, yeah. Wonderful. And you can put it in the chat box or you can unmute yourself. Yes, exactly. We're a small enough group, I think, uh, to... Um, so Howard, I'm, I'm going yeah. to unmute. I think I can unmute all and see if anyone would like to, uh, to chime in and give us uh, any feedback. This is Michael from Word Vision again. I, I have a quick uh, a point to Isabella, um, more of a question. Um, so how do we find the fine tuning or the equilibrium in, in the power dynamics between the community uh, organization or the local organization versus the donor organization in terms of independence versus meeting the need, which, which will for, for, for sure require some culture change from, from the donor organization and which you touch, touched a little on, on, on your book. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Michael. Um, I think power dynamics are inherent, especially where large amounts of um, resources are being uh, directed from one, one you know, actor to another. Um, but just because the money travels that way, um, it doesn't have to be that all power also has to be concentrated in, in, the, in the hands of the um, holders of the resources. Because um, even with the growing critique of localization and the commitments that were made, let's say just in the humanitarian sector, to increase uh, direct funding to local actors, uh, which hasn't happened yet um, since those commitments were uh, put in place in the World Humanitarian Summit in 2016. Even in those discussions, we see that local organizations are not just saying we need more money. We need, you know, larger amounts of funds to be transferred to us. What many, often what they are asking for in parallel or sometimes even more so is more seats at the table where decisions are made. And that, you, um, you know, that decision to invite others um, and make the decision-making process more transparent, more um, democratic, if you will, 
uh, and engage a lot more stakeholders um, is not an impossible feat. It has been done by organizations. It has, there are many different ways to do it, uh, including transferring the funds into a, uh, some sort of a community oversight kind of fund where um, they get to decide how to allocate them. I mean, part of this was tried in the National Solidarity Program in Afghanistan. Yes, with lots of different you know, findings there as well, but it has been tried in Global um, Fund for Community Foundations and many other organizations are advocating for different ways to shift the power dynamics in both uh, resource allocation and in decision making. It is a cultural change, I completely agree with you. Um, and I think honest conversations and not shying away from talking about power and, and uh, the various you know, power gradients and how decisions are made along, those power, along the power gradient are really important. This is not to say that um, this sort of similar power dynamics don't exist in local context um, with, without outsiders. Uh, we've heard that time and time again during the listening project where indigenous communities would say, uh, you know, in Ecuador would feel that an engineer from Quito, just because he's from Ecuador, uh, doesn't really understand local communities any better than somebody from Sweden. And so the elitism and uh, all sorts of other issues and power dynamics in the local context are also important to understand and deal with. Oh, Yindra, you're muted. Um, thank you very much. So, uh, I mean, one of the, Ruxandra said, um, you know, how she perceives sustainability, um, uh, questions of the difference of perceptions with colleagues and beneficiaries, ex post importance, expectation, accumulated effects, impact value for the locals, planned exit. I'm, I'm glad she loved it. For me, a big thing was the benchmarking. Holta's benchmarking was something that I think is unbelievably important. If anyone you know, puts in a project proposal, we're going to, you know, the, our projects are going to be sustainable. It's like, okay, well, for how long and among how many, right? And how will you know? We've just done a big uh, project for uh, an environmental facility. And, you know, they claimed that they had 60% of their projects were entirely sustainable and we saw no proof of it. Um, there's a lot of claims that are made uh, and lots of assumptions made that we're just like, excellent. We hope mm -hmm. that's true, prove it. Please go on. Some of the other feedback is uh, project participants should be involved in the sustainability plans. Um, Alvana said, uh, you know, the engagement of people is really important. I mean, I was just heartbroken, heartbroken by the logos on the Thai houses that they're still waiting for us to come back. That literally makes me want to weep. You know, the expectations we're setting up and how are we disappointing people? Um, that was, um, um, just to reiterate that, because that touched, uh, that quote also touched me. It was the first time that I, that I saw it. But the group that I shared, the IPT, um, G group, um, World Vision, strangely uh, left that community, but is in a next door community. So one of their um, uh, biggest disappointments was you kind of like finished the job and washed your hands. You are next door. Like, can't you come and say hello? That part of connecting uh, was important to people and was something that we hadn't necessarily considered that um, once you exit a community, even if, um, if it's not only to go and measure with an ex post evaluation what has remained, that definitely gives a point of contact and maintaining, but people crave that relationship. And uh, it might not necessarily be the case everywhere, but if it's possible, if you have a next door program, 
um, make sure to, uh, to connect the programs. Make sure to connect your old program, especially the groups that you left behind with your new program. That will bring a much better and bigger change uh, than keeping uh, the focus just on the project that you have at hand. I just want to say a very short story. We shared our findings uh, with Helen Keller. Helen Keller in CRS Niger, uh, Helen Keller is, was an NGO that co-implemented. And as I think Becky said, or Albana said, the program staff left. Um, they were partners in the original project and they just, they left Niger, they came back, we shared the results and they were like, we did that. You know, and it's phenomenal for them to learn from the results of the earlier team. Uh, knowledge management is unbelievably important. Planning to do an ex post, saving the who are the participant lists, what is their contact information, right? It is unbelievably hard to try and recreate this if we don't know who participated. So as Holta said, don't just, you know, say goodbye and Isabella as well. Um, we have three minutes left. Is there anyone else um, uh, of Holta, do you have any last words? Uh, Isabella, do you have any last words? And um, I will now stop. I guess we haven't mentioned um, COVID and the pandemic we are all experiencing in such a shared way across the globe. And, and how that impacts some of what we were discussing. And I just want to say that um, just in this last three months, following the discussions on various uh, platforms and um, group calls, as well as blogs posted on DevEx and a number of other places, it's been interesting to see how the role of local organizations and local communities, local health workers, community health workers, um, is, is hopefully more acknowledged and recognized. Uh, but one thing that Yindra and I have been discussing is while the responsibilities are elevated, the, um, the frontline organizations are at the, you know, at the front line of the response to the pandemic. We still are keeping our fingers crossed that the resources and the trust in local actors will follow. And I don't know if others um, uh, want to comment on how COVID. I think it will bring a lot more uh, realistic expectations of um, um, sustainability in terms of um, looking at it through the eyes of resilience and fully understanding that um, this ideal of things the same or better uh, that we project on sustainability, um, but fully understanding that we actually are talking about uh, recognizing that there is adaptation and there is needs that need, uh, things that need to change. So I believe there will be a stronger focus on understanding what's resilient and what does resilience mean and tying in uh, the talk about sustainability and resilience uh, much more tighter. Um, additionally, I think that it's gonna force a lot of us to probably exit um, where we have stayed too long because the funding realities will force us. What, uh, what others did not do, uh, because organizations also tend to be self-serving in a way. We need more funding. We have uh, a lot of uh, structures to maintain. Therefore, the incentives for exits um, often are also not as big. I think those will be uh, increased. How to do that responsibly, it's gonna determine a lot on uh, what we find on um, sustainability. Capturing stories, capturing the stories of today. What we can tell time and uh, time again about the difficulty of, uh, of telling a story on sustainability, it's the lack of lack of records, the lack of knowing uh, how things worked. Um, well, here is the opportunity. Um, we do not know if there is gonna be an ex post five years from now or 10 years from now. But if we don't plan as if there is gonna be, and we do not know how people felt and what they did and how they did it, then we won't be prepared five years or 10 years before now. We're gonna still have the same issues. So that's, um, look at what is happening right now and collect all the information and insight and do not think surveys, think of experiences, think of um, talking to, uh, to people and record it now with the idea that you will um, make good use of it tomorrow. Wonderful. So we have reached 4 p.m. 
we have filled up two hours of your time and you've been mm -hmm. such an amazing group. Wonderful engagement. Thank you so much for listening to us. The recording will be shared. Howard, do you want to tell us any more or, um, or the other fellow about um, how this will be disseminated? Thank you so much to Holta and Isabella. I'm so grateful. I learn every single time I talk to you. Thank you. Thanks, Holta. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Nothing more to share on my end, Richard. I'm not sure if you do. We will have the recording and all the uh, PowerPoint materials available to our participants. Yeah, everything will be shared. Um, obviously, the, the team at the UN conference have everyone's email addresses, so that will follow um, very, very soon. But um, thank you, everyone, for your contribution today. Really, really interesting discussion. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank be you well. Sustainability. Go be Don't sustainable. <laughs> Bye, Go <everyone>. listen. <laughs>